the same. <laughs> it was the same in my in my visit. <clears throat> Good morning. We are about to initiate the first uh, session in this uh, program, <coughs> uh, International Colloquium Christian Missionaries as Intercultural Intellectuals. The first uh, uh, panel is uh, devoted to China and Japan. We have uh, five uh, panelists and uh, we will have around uh, a little less than uh, half an hour for, for each, one, each one of you. And at the end, if you agree, we can have still half an hour for questions. In the end, for everyone, if you agree. So you have close to half an hour for your uh, exposition. And in the end, we will have all the, all the questions and commentaries uh, together. So, yes, 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 perhaps. <laughs> Just the, the, the seconds that we take in the presentation. So we will, uh, this morning, uh, we will start with uh, Professor Elisabetta Corsi from the Università La Sapienza de Roma. Uh, Elisabetta is Chair Professor of Scenology at the Department of History, Cultures and Religions of Sapienza State University of Rome and Coordinator of the Directed Study Program in Arts and Humanities for International Exchange Students. She has lectured on classical Chinese and history of Sinology at the Colmex from 1994 until 2007. Her research interests focus on the role of Jesuit missionaries as scientific mediators during the early modern period, mainly in the field of mixed mathematics, such as optics and linear perspective and on the transmission of Aristotelian natural philosophy through the production, translation, and circulation of printed works, mainly in classical Chinese. Her current research project is entitled Historical and Philological Approaches to the Transmission of Aristotelian Culture to China through the Jesuit Mission during the Early Modern Period. Her paper this morning is entitled Franciscan Missionaries and Healthcare in China, the case of the Bencao Bu by Pedro de la Piñuela of the uh, Franciscan order from 1650 to 1704. Professor. Muchísimas gracias. Antes de empezar mi presentación en inglés, voy a dirigir algunas palabras en español, si me lo años, y en particular recordar un proyecto de investigación que tuvimos uh, que fue coordinado por el profesor David Lorenzen y estaba eh, a, en, entre los participantes, tuve el privilegio de, de estar yo. ¿Se escucha bien? Este, tuve el privilegio más, más cerca, que en realidad tengo voz alta, así que creo que más o menos. Este, entonces fue coordinado, eh, logramos un apoyo por el CONACYT desde 2000 a 2005, el proyecto fue coordinado por el profesor David Lorenzen. Yo tuve el privilegio de participar junto con Francisco Morales, quien va a presentar mañana. Y es precisamente sobre la, los franciscanos y la formación intelectual y su labor cultural en, en, en Nueva España, India y China. Entonces, como forma de homenaje a, <coughs> perdón, al profesor Lorenzen, decidí escoger este, un trabajo nuevo, que es una investigación eh, relacionada con Pedro de la Piñuela, pero acerca de un tratado, de una obra que en ese momento nosotros no habíamos investigado. Habíamos investigado el corpus del eh, teológico religioso, pero no su materia médica. Entonces, eso quiere ser un homenaje especial al profesor Lorenzen. Gracias. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to make uh, um, um, I'd like to uh, make a few comments regarding the structure of this seminar according to my understanding and first of all I'd like to recall that uh, in 2005 a monographic issue on of Ar Archivum Historicum Societatis Jesu appeared uh, this is the journal of the society the major journal of the Society of Jesus appeared under the title, The Jesuits and Cultural Inter Intermediacy in the Early Modern World. The volume was edited 
by Diogo Ramada Curto at that time, Vasco da Gama, Professor Chair in the history of European expansion at the Uni uh, European University Institute of Florence. This collection of essays, resulting from a three-day conference held at the Institute's premises a few years earlier, was a successful attempt at exploring the tensions and ambiguities of missionary intermediation and cultural brokerage. In this respect, the Society of Jesus seemed to constitute an ideal case to observe, given the Jesuits' commitment in the fields of scholarship, education, and sciences. Missionaries of the Society of Jesus are iconic as cross-cultural messengers, Ramada Curto pointed out in the introduction. The results achieved by this volume have contributed to pave the way towards new trends in the scholarship of over, on overseas Christian missions, in particular by avoiding, and I quote, untroubled, untroubled characterization of the Jesuits as simple mediators between different worlds, as effortless agents in a complex network of communication, the volume showed awareness of two major risks. The first being that of reducing mainly to tools of knowledge those processes of cultural intermediation that belonged essentially to the domain of religion. The second being that of obfuscating the imperialistic and colonial dimensions of global and connected history. Indeed, as it's been suggested in uh, a, a very important book, The Birth of the Modern World, 1780-1914, Global Connections and Comparisons, interconnections and networks seem to speak of dialogue and accommodation rather than of dominance. Thanks to works such as the monographic volume of Archivum, scholars are now much more aware of the coexistence of domination and, and exploitation with more flexible forms of negotiation, mediation, or adaptation that characterize the history of encounters. If a limit is to be found in Ramada Curto's edited volume of RC, it is that of having reduced missionary encounters with non-European civilizations to Jesuit encounters, as if Jesuit missionaries were the only agents of cultural mediation. This international seminar, in my understanding, is an attempt to overcome such limit by broadening the spectrum of observation to include Franciscan and Dominicans, orders, as well as Protestant missionaries. By an emphasis on scientific encounters, the seminar, in my understanding, can also be seen as a contribution to that global history of science that is slowly yet timidly making a presence felt in the intellectual milieu that has been to this day dominated by a strong bias on case studies. My presentation will make another example of a case study in the history of medicine, and yet the global dimension of the case uh, that I have analyzed has not been overlooked. Indeed, I will focus on an ideal case of missionary encounter on a global scale, the encounter of the Franciscan Mexican friar, Pedro de la Pinuela, and his book on Materia Medica, Ben Sao Bo, with Chinese medical knowledge, Ben Sao Bo can be translated as supplement to the Materia Medica, being intended as a sequel to one of the most important Chinese medical books, the Ben Sao Gan Mo, systematically arranged Materia Medica, composed by the physician Li Shi Zhen, who lived in 1518 until 1593, and the book was printed in 1593. The treatise by Pedro de la Pinuela can be seen as the result of the blending of different medical traditions because it describes simples. Simples are technically uh, officinal plants, as you know, unknown to China, many of them imported from the New World, as well as simples that are largely present in the country but whose healing properties are not known. The author of the Ben Sao Po, sorry, Pedro de la Pinuela, is a Mexican Creole born in Mexico City in 1650. I'd like to give you a few details. These are technical details regarding the, uh, the tract and also the uh, different sections um, that 
composed, the, the, make, the, the book is made of, while uh, I'll, I'll give a few details about Pedro de la Pinuela. And I was saying that he's a Mexican Creole born in Mexico City in 1650. We don't know exactly when he entered the order, but we know that he was a discarded friar of San Pedro de Alcantara, Alcantarinos. The arrival to Mexico in 1577 of 10 friars Alcantarinos bound for the Far East marked the beginning of a long-standing connection between the future province of San Gregorio in the Philippines and New Spain, as everybody knows in this, in, uh, in this, uh, in, the, in the Colegio. As it is known, the Alcantarin province of San Diego de Me in Mexico was established in 1580 by Felipe II at the request of Pedro de Alfaro, uh, superior of the delegation of ten friars. The reason for the establishment of the province was to provide adequate shelter to those missionaries who, sailing on Spanish vessels along the Atlantic route, had to reach Asia through the Philippines via New Spain. The province of San Diego was initially dependent on the province of San Gregorio in the Philippines, but became autonomous at the beginning of the 17th century, even though the two provinces remained connected at least until the beginning of the 19th century. It is uh, in the convents of the province of San Diego, among which is that of Churubusco in Mexico City, the friars uh, bound for the Asian missions could gather the goods, goods and objects necessary to the daily life. Among the goods that uh, found their way to Asia on board the Galeon were also uh, offici officino, of, officino plants and medicines. It should be noted in this context that collecting, studying, and trading medical plants was uh, mm, as had been an essential aspect of Felipe's colonial enterprise. He had sponsored the uh, publication of important works. He had sponsored the publication of important work, works in the field of materia medica, such as the um, La primera y segunda, you see the frontispiece here, e tercera parte de la historia medicinal de las cosas que se traen de nuestra Indias Occidentales, que sirven en medicina, 1574, composed by Gonzalo Fernández de Oviedo and Nicolás Monartes. Several editions in major languages were published in Europe, thereby contributing to a wide circulation of medical knowledge uh, concerning symbols of the New World, a knowledge that it is reflected also in the Ben Saopu. Another example I'd like to make concerns a truly global enterprise. You see the portrait of Monardes here, and then uh, also I put a couple of engravings of the tobacco. This is the first book in which images of the tobacco appeared, as you know, and this is uh, uh, the truly global enterprise um, resulting from the manuscript reports of Felipe's physicians, Francisco Hernandez and Nardo Antonio Recchi, edited and integrated by a remarkable team of naturalists, Federico Cesi, founder of the Academia dei Lincei, Johannes Faber, Fabio Colonna, and Johannes Terentius Schreck, the physician and naturalist who was later in life to join the Society of Jesus and end up his brilliant career as a missionary in China. Evidence of the strong link between New Spain and the missionaries traveling to China under Spanish auspices is the fact that at least until the end of the 17th century, New Spain provides economic sustain to the seraphic missions in China. And this is particularly this aspect as far as the Tibet uh, mission is being researched by Professor Lawrence, and although in a rather scanty way, given the frequent complaints of the friars about the inadequacy of the resources, complaints that occur in the letters addressed to their superiors. Pedro is only a young deacon when he joins the delegation of friars headed by Bonaventura Ibanez with whom he embarks on the Galeon at Acapulco on the 18th of March, 1671. 
We have no clues about Pino El Azali education, but we can assume that he was trained at the College of Churubusco. Pedro reaches Manila in 1672 and on the 7th of April is incorporated in the province of San Gregorio. After a period of training, most probably also in the hospitals and infirmaries run by the Franciscans in Manila, he is sent to China in 1676. He will spend 28 years between Guangdong and Fujian provinces of South, South China and will any problem? No. And will pass on the Quanzhou uh, on the 30th of July, 1704. By virtue of his outstanding administrative qual qualities, combined with a remarkable linguistic talent, which enabled him to give body to um, an extensive production of uh, spiritual, devotional, and theological texts in semi-vernacular Chinese he can be considered not only as one of the most important Franciscan missionaries in China, but also the most reputed Mexican missionary of San Diego's province. In fact, in the Catalogus Religiosorum, uh, uh, a catalog, uh, a survey of all the missionaries that resided in the Seraphic missions from the second half of the 16th century to the beginning of the 18th century, composed by Pedro and published in Mexico City at the beginning of the 18th century. Of the 52 friars listed therein, Pedro appears to be the most prolific author with 11 works in Chinese, to which we have to add an extensive epistolary in Latin and Spanish, a unique source of information on the material life of the Franciscan missions in Guangdong and Fujian during the 17th century. Pedro's letters and reports, bless you, are also an extremely useful primary source for the study of one of the most complex periods in the history of Catholic missions in China, a period that is characterized by political riots that shake the fragile stability of Asian kingdoms, such as those of Vietnam and Cambodia, rivalry among religious orders and among missionaries of different nationalities, antagonism against the Jesuits, and last but not least, the rights controversy. controversy. Healthcare, especially directed towards the poor, had always been proper to the mendicant orders. Ever since they set foot in Asia, Franciscans established hospitals and infirmaries as part of the missionary strategy. Although the history of these hospitals is often confusing because, sorry, they frequently changed names um, and places. Recent essays by Claudia Foncolani contributed to shed light on the issue. Franciscan missionaries not only engaged in medicine, surgery, and pharmacopoeia, but also produced important medical texts, such as those written by Blas de la Madre de Dios, namely Flora de Filipinas, 1611, Tratado de Medicina Domestica, also known as Libro de Medicinas Caseras para Consuelo de los Religiosos y Alivio de los Enfermos. Blas de la Madre de Dios, a Portuguese from Lisbon, did a pioneering job in identifying, collecting, and studying medical plants in the Philippines. Indeed, his texts were part of a long heritage because medical practice among religious orders had given birth already during the medieval time to a specific kind of book, a prototype of the Flora de Filipinas known as Herbarium. It has been noted that this term conveys various different meanings, but above all, it indicates a manuscript containing descriptions of medical plants. I will not dwell here on the history of the typology of such a book, but would like to recall the importance of uh, the De Materia Medica on, ma on medical material by Dioscorides. Dioscorides. Uh, I should have... Uh, I should have, we have a frontispiece of uh, the Lyon, we are well into the Renaissance when the book is finally 
printed. Um, it is a book dating back to the third century BC, as you know, since this was the most influential encyclopedia and pharmacopoeia, pharmacopoeia of herbs and medicines that contributed to shape late medieval and early medical knowledge in Europe. If on one hand, philological and exegetical practices contributed to the recovery of ancient texts on nature of philosophy by the humanists, on the other hand, towards the end of the 16th century, the practice of outdoor herbarization, along with the discovery of new worlds, made the naturalists feel the need to integrate and amend the ancient body of texts on Materia Medica. An exemplary naturalist of this period is Francesco Redi, who lived from 1626 to 1697, the Archiata chief physician to Cosimo III in Florence. In a long letter addressed to Athanasius Kircher, Reddy informs the eminent Jesuit about a visit that a few Franciscan missionaries paid to the Archduke on their way back from India. They were carrying stones with marvelous properties. Reddy, who believed that far esperienza, making experience, was far more important than the authority of text, was rather skeptical about the thaumaturgic properties of stones extracted by snakes' bowels. Nonetheless, Pedro, in his Ben Sao Po, devotes a long and detailed paragraph. Um, you must have seen it in the, in the we, we can go back to the Ben Salbu to see. He devotes a long and detailed paragraph to the Lapis Serpentinum. All the different <coughs> the, the stone that protects the heart. Bao Shi, Bazaar Stone, Sidu Shi, Venom Attractive Stone, Snake Stone. So Pedro devotes a long and detailed paragraph to the Lapis Serpentinus, the snake stone, in which he describes the properties of the stone as an antidote against poison. He's also aware of the fact that properties of the stone had been earlier introduced into China, most probably in response to Kanxi's, initial, Kanxi's emperor of the Qing dynasty, initial interest in European medicine by the Flemish Jesuit Ferdinand Ferbist in a tract entitled Si Du Shi, the, si du shi, the Venom Attracting Stone, or the Stone That Attracts Venom. Snake stones were not recorded in Min or even early Qing Materia Medica. As Martha Hanson has shown, Li Shi Zhen described several types of stones associated with snakes, such as Shi Huan, yellow of the snake, Shi Han Shi, stone contained within a, a snake. These snake stones were most likely the bazaar a concretion found in the stomachs and intestines of some animals, usually ruminants, and sometimes in humans. Bezor was thought to be a poison antidote and was known throughout the ancient world. The more common type of bezor in Chinese medicine came, came from Katu and was called Niu Huan, yellow of oxen, or oxen bezor. Instead of a concretion from the stomach or intestines of snakes, Ferbeast wrote about a substance or conglomeration that came from the head of snakes, and its origin in, were, in, were to be placed in India, not in China. Ferbeast's statement tallies with Reddy's description of the bizarre stones. At the same time, Francesco Reddy's text strongly suggests a link between the dissemination of knowledge about the healing properties of snake stones and the seraphic order. Here is a long quotation for those who can read Italian from Francesco Redi's report on the visit of the Zoccolanti, probably the discarded Franciscan who had paid a visit to Cosimo and brought him uh, as gifts those stones. And there are the details, the reference regarding the, uh, the text in which Francesco Redi publishes the letter uh, to Athanasius Kircher. 
we uh, well, you, we won't read, uh, we won't read the quotation. Here is how, on the, on the other hand, we will, uh, we will uh, um, uh, refer to uh, what Pedro says in the Pensaupu about the stones. Um, here is how Pedro describes the virtues of snake stones, revealing to be still a follower of Paracelsian doctrines, even though by the end of the 17th century, they were beginning to be superseded by a more empirical and experimental medical doctrine. They, these are probably the most beautiful pages of the Bensao Bo. All animals, I have made a translation, uh, um, well, there were very different passages because I have firstly translated from Chinese into Italian, and then I couldn't get back to the Chinese text and I translated later on the Italian into English, so I'm sorry if it is not uh, exactly to the point. All animals possess a taste that is in tune with their nature. This is why they feed themselves, taking from plants only, only the nutrients they need to sustain their body. Poisonous insects, by their nature, love to eat what contains venom in order to grow and keep themselves alive and protect their body like the shield of, for soldiers, horns for oxen, and claws for felines. If poisonous insects nourish themselves with feed that does not contain poison, it would be as if oxen had no fodder to eat. They simply could not stay alive. Therefore, poison is really what poisonous animals love and need. This principle is so true that according to Pedro, everyone can experiment it. He says, take some poisonous material of any kind and bury it. Then take a snake to which skillfully you have extracted all the poison. Then bury the snake together with the poisonous stuff. The snake flesh will suck the poison contained in the soil and will gather it into its flesh. You see that the property of the snake stone to suck the poison stems from the fact that the substance it is made of, the stone is made of, is, the same, is of the same nature of the poisonous snake. Snake species are innumerable. Everyone possesses its own degree of, or degree of evilness. Therefore, each of them has its own antidote. Among flying species, there are bugs or insects that share the same poisonous nature of certain plants. Among terrestrial and aquatic species, there are snakes, scorpions, shrimps, and frogs. Among these species that move in the ethereal space, there are flies, spiders, locusts, mosquitoes, and so forth. Each one of them can be employed to naturalize poison, feeding it with nutrients of the same nature. In so doing, they will be of great benefit to the human race. Pedro's word remind us of the so-called doctrine of the signature, by which plants have something in common with the pathologies they can cure. Nonetheless, according to Pedro, such continuous consonance among living beings, by which one reminds of another, and each one of them is capable of being an antidote to the evilness of the other, acquires also a profound theological and spiritual value. And I quote from Pedro, from the Brinsaubu, this process makes even more manifest the creator's love for human beings in union and harmony with among all species, every one according to its own nature is the true beauty of the universe. Conclusions uh, for the last few minutes. In this paper, I have tried strong, short presentation. I have tried to reconstruct the context of production of a medical text, the Ben Saubu, written by a Franciscan missionary, Mexican missionary who spent 28 years in China, Pedro de la Pinuela. Unlike the majority of missionary texts on Materia Medica, they were published 
that were published and circulated in Europe and were produced for a European reading community, the Ben Cao Bu addressed a community of Chinese readers who possessed the necessary medical knowledge to be able to understand and apply the prescriptions provided by Pedro. Dwelling on a consolidated local tradition, Pedro seeks to integrate it, introducing new plants and new remedies derived from those plants. Although his writing still betrays a reliance on the tenets of Paracelsian medicine, we can consider Ben Sao Bu as a valuable testimony of an earlier circulation of medical knowledge, of a medical knowledge that conjures up experiences acquired in a broad space of action, one in which China is intimately linked with the new as well as the old world. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Professor Corsi for keeping to time for uh, this excellent presentation. And uh, we will have questions about this paper and the rest of the papers at uh, 1.15. Next, we will have our uh, colleague, Dr. Jose Antonio Cervera. Who will uh, expose his uh, uh, paper, Chinese Philosophy and Religions, seen by the Mendicant Friars in the Philippines in the 16th century. I think there's a, a difference between the interpretation and misunderstanding. I am sorry. I have two, two titles, two different okay. titles. This is the one. Okay. All right. Uh, Dr. Cervera, his doctor in ciencia, is doctor in Ciencias Físicas y doctor en Estudios de Asia y África, especialidad en China. Actualmente es profesor investigador de tiempo completo en el Centro de Estudios de Asia y África del Colegio de México. Su tema principal de investigación es la introducción de la ciencia europea en China a través de los misioneros especialmente la labor de los primeros dominicos y agustinos que en Filipinas estuvieron en contacto con la comunidad china en el siglo XVI y la labor matemática y astronómica de los jesuitas en China en el siglo XVII. Ha publicado tres libros y numerosos capítulos y artículos de investigación. And I believe the correct title is this one here. No, it's, it's, yes, it's. The Interpretation and Misunderstanding of Chinese Philosophy by Juan Cobo of uh, OP in his Shilu of 1593. Uh, thank you very much. Eh, bueno, agradezco a todos, eh, a todos los asistentes y sobre todo, bueno, para mí es, es un gusto tener aquí a tan importantes mm, eh, investigadores sobre el tema de los misioneros. Eh, tanto David Lorenzen como yo estamos encantados de haber eh, organizado este evento y bueno, eh, espero que dé para, pues para una muy rica discusión. Eh, por cierto, invito a los que están allá sentados detrás a que se sienten en estas sillas, por favor. No, lo digo en serio. ¿eh? <risa> eh, well, I, I will read my, my presentation in English, uh, so uh, in order to, to have time exactly. The order of preachers or Dominicans was the last of the four main religious orders that went to the Philippines in the 16th century. But Dominicans were the first dedicated to preaching to the Chinese settled in the archipelago. The main objective of all of the missionaries who went to East Asia at that time was to arrive in China. When Dominicans arrived in the Philippines in 1587, none of the other religious orders were seriously dealing with the Chinese or learning their language. The Dominicans, from the very beginning, considered such a task as one of the most important ones in the Philippine archipelago. The first Dominican friar who was able to master Chinese, both spoken and written, was Juan Cobo. Juan Cobo was born in Consuegra, Toledo, 
1546 or 1547. He was educated at the convent of Ocaña, where he entered the order of preachers in 1563. He studied at Santo Tomás in Avila. He decided there to go to East Asia. He left Cadiz in 1587 and remained in New Spain for a few months until he finally arrived in Manila in May 1588. Shortly after his arrival, he was sent to preach the gospel to Sanglais, Chinese residents in Manila. Apparently, he learned Chinese in, very, in a very short time. In 1592, the Spanish governor, Pedro Gómez das Mariñas, sent Cobo as an ambassador to Japan to meet Toyotomi Hideyoshi. He accomplished his mission, but he wanted to return to the Philippines in a hurry at the end of 1592 when the weather was not good for navigation. His ship sank and he died in Taiwan. Thanks to his language skills and his relation with the Sanglais, Kobo was able to know Chinese culture and classical literature, a fact that would influence the composition of his two important books. Despite the short time he spent in the Philippines before he died, only four years, Kobo is the author of several of the most interesting documents written in East Asia by European during the 16th century. Apart from several uh, doubtful works, there are four extant texts. Carta de la China, letter about China, to Dominican friars of the province of Guatemala and Chiapas, describing the Parian of Manila, the neighborhood where Sanglais lived. Doctrina Cristiana en Letra y Lengua China, Christian Doctrine in Chinese Language. This book contains many foreign words and its purpose is to provide the fundamental truths of the Christian religion to the new converts. In this book, many of the Christian terms are transcribed in, into, China's, into Chinese using a phonetic method from a Western language such as Latin or Spanish. According to their language and contents, the Doctrina Cristiana and the Shelu may be considered as very different and, at the same time, complementary works. The Pensin Pokam, or Minxin Pao Chien, Rich Mirror of the Clear Heart, is the most important book by Juan Cobo, along with his Shelu. This is the first Chinese book translated into Spanish. The Minxin Pao Chien is a bilingual book. The pages on the left have the original Chinese text, and the pages on the right the translation into Spanish by Cobo. Cobo had arrived in the Philippines in 1588. He could hardly have translated the book by himself. No doubt, he had a Chinese co collaborator to carry, a, uh, to carry on the task. This book consists of statements by several Chinese classical authors on ethics or human relations. This is not a classical Chinese book, such as the Analects of Confucius, but a compilation of very different texts. Apart from Confucius and Mencius, there are also fragments from the Taoist Lao Tzu and Chuan Tzu, the Neo-Confucian Chu Xi, and even extracts from edicts of several emperors of the Tang and Song dynasties. Why was the Min Xin Pao Qian translated by Kobo? According to several researchers, Kobo's main objective was the Shelu. Before this, he translated the Min Xin Pao Qian almost like a homework. In order to write a book in Chinese, he decided to translate and study in depth a Chinese book on moral, the Min Xin Pao Qian. But his real project was to let the Sanglais know the philosophical foundations of the Catholic faith. This was to be conducted through his Shelu. The Pian Chen Chao Chen Chuan Shelu, I will, I will use Shelu as a short name in this paper, which may be more or less translated as authentic record of the discussion of the true spread of the Orthodox faith, is one of the most important books ever written concerning scientific and cultural exchanges between East and West. From a bibliographical point of view, this is one of the first two books printed in the Philippines. From a sinological point of view, this is the second book 
written in Chinese by a European, after the Tianchu Shelu by Michele Ruggeri. It is also the first test written in Chinese that tries to introduce the Catholic religion from a rational, non-dogmatic point of view. The Shelu is also the first book written in Chinese introducing European scientific ideas of that time. If we add that this is, as far as we know, the first book written in Chinese which clearly states that the earth is round, giving evidence to prove it, we must conclude that Cobos Shelu is one of the most important Spanish and Chinese books of all times. The Shelu is adapt adapted from the Introduction al Símbolo de la Fe, Introduction to the Symbol of Faith, by the Dominican Fray Luis de Granada, published in Salamanca in 1583. Unlike the Doctrina Cristiana in Letra y Lengua China, addressed to the new converts, the Shelu is directed no, eh, to non-Christian Chinese intellectuals who look for a detailed explanation of why they should believe in the Christian religion. The Shelu is written as a dialogue between a European friar, Kobo, and a Chinese intellectual, to whom Kobo explains his ideas and answers his questions. According to Fidel Villarroel and Liuli May, this intellectual was probably the person who helped Cobo to write the Shelu using a literary style. By the way, uh, you have here the first, um, the first page of this book, and this picture, uh, you see a Chinese, a Chinese uh, um, one of the literati, talking with a monk, probably Cobo. So this picture was used uh, in our program because for me it's, it's, it's a very clear picture of a dialogue between a Western and a Eastern. No? Well, uh, the Shelu is similar to what Richie would do in China several years later with his, with his uh, Tianchu Shi. Yi. The difference is not only the time of publication but also the subject. Kobo's book has more scientific contents than a uh, richest one. The Shelu has nine chapters. Generally speaking, the first three chapters deal with philosophical and theological ideas, and the other six ones are related to science. It is especially remarkable, the fourth chapter, where the author introduces Ptolemaic cosmological system. You have here the cosmological uh, system in Chinese, the first one a world map and the statement that the earth is round with several arguments to prove it. As far as we know, this is the first Chinese test in all history that clearly says that the earth is round. You have here uh, one of the proofs. Uh, well, it is said that the, the shadow of a circle is circular. The shadow of a triangle is triangular. The shadow of a square is a square. So, uh, in a uh, moon eclipse, we see uh, the shadow of the Earth, and it's always round. That proves very clearly that the Earth is round. It's very, very interesting. Well, uh, the Shelu, as a work of cultural exchange between Asia and Europe, uses sources from both continents. The Shelu is written in classical Chinese, which implies not only a kind of language and style, but also the inclusion of numerous quotations from ancient Chinese authors. Kobo tried to fully cynicize his book. The text is full of historical and philosophical references belonging to the Chinese context, taken from the classic books or from the geographical and cultural Chinese context. In this paper, we will see several examples. In the fourth chapter, a Chinese asks Kobo how the things are formed. The European religious answers as follows. You have it here. Sun Da Yue Si Tai Ji Shen Liang Yi Liang Yi Shen Si Xiang Si Xiang Fa Shen Er Shu Lei Fang Yi. Fidel Villarroel edited in 19. Uh, 86 Cobos Shelu and translated into Spanish and English. In fact, the first translation was made from Chinese into Spanish by Antonio Dor Dominguez and Villarroel translated from Spanish to English. The translation by Villarroel of this fragment is, the father answers, since the time 
the infinite produced the two principles, the two principles produced the four phenomena, the four phenomena reproduced themselves and thus the species of the beings appeared. This is the time to focus on an issue which may explain why the Shelu had so little dissemination at his time. This is the abundant use, I would say too much use, of philosophical concepts of Chinese tradition. Let's consider, for instance, two terms that are widely used in Kobo's book, Uchi and Taiji. Uchi, which could be translated more or less as limitless, without limits, is used 62 times in the book, while Taiji, which is usually translated as supreme ultimate, appears 27 times. In Shelou's translation into English by Villarroel, both terms are, are usually translated as infinite, although sometimes he uses other expressions to translate Taiji, such as Señor Soberano, Sovereign Lord, Señor Infinito, Infinite Lord, Dios Infinito, Infinite God, or Espíritu Infinito, Infinite Spirit. No doubt, Kobo used the term Taiji for God and Uchi to designate the infinity of God. However, the use of these terms could be misleading. Both words can be found in the I Ching, or Book of Changes, one of the most influential Chinese classics in history, as well as in Taoist philosophers such as Lao Tse or Chuan Tse. In the 16th century, in Kobo's times, its meaning is to be found mainly in the works of the Neo-Confucian philosophers of the Song and Ming dynasties. Chou Tung Yi, the first famous Neo-Confucian philosopher, provided a cosmology and metaphysics in Confucian philosophy, previously absent in classical Confucianism. He published a diagram about the Taiji, the Taiji Tu, and wrote a brief text with explanation or comment of that diagram, the Taiji Tu Shuo. In this test, Chou Tung Yi used the terms Uji and Taiji and said that both concepts were equal. Uji are Taiji. Then he said that Taiji gives rise to yin and yang, the two forces from which the five elements or processes, the Uxin, are formed. Water, Shui, fire, Huo, wood, Mu, metal, yin, and earth, Tu. The Uxin gives rise to the 10,000 things, Wang Wu or everything in the universe. The conception of Taiji by Chou Tungyi would be taken by the most famous and influential Neo-Confucian philosopher, Chu Xi. Thereafter, it would be established within the orthodoxy of Chinese philosophy during the following dynasties. That is why the Shelu was probably misinterpreted by Chinese intellectuals. The terms used in the book could lead to totally wrong assumptions about the Christian God. Let's see several examples. In the, uh, in the fragment quoted above, Kobo said, Zi tai ji, shen liang yi, liang yi shen zi xiang. The infinite produced the two principles. The two principles produced the four phenomena. This sentence is interesting because it is a synthesis of cosmological and physical European and Chinese ideas. First of all, Kobo uses to refer to infinity the already mentioned Neo-Confucian concepts, Taiji. The, the two principles are obviously the yang and the yin. But what are the four phenomena? We could think that the author refers to the four biograms, Tai Yang, Tai Yin, Xiao Yang, and Xiao Yin, which in the field of divination are four secondary figures formed by the double application of binary principle Yang Yin. However, according to the Chinese worldview, these four biograms are not so widely used. It is much more common to consider that the two, Yang and Yin, do not give rise to four, but to five, the five elements, the Wu Xing. These Wu Xing give rise to all things. Referring to the four phenomena or biograms, Kobo uses a Chinese form equally valid but clearly forced as a way to not forget about the four elements of Empedocles and Aristotle, which was the common conception of physics in Europe at his time, fire, air, 
water and earth. The example above is a strange mixture of European and Chinese philosophical concepts. However, in other uh, fragments of the Shelu, the language is even closer to the traditional Neo-Confucian thought. For instance, in the beginning of the fourth chapter, Kobo states, Liang Yi Tian Wu, the five apart from the two. This fragment refers clearly to the five elements of pro or processes, the Uxing. The misunderstanding uh, could be even greater in some fragments where the character Li appears. For example, in the second chapter, Kobo says, uh, Li Yo Taiji, this sentence is translated by Villarroel as the first cause is primordial, but it was translated by Dominguez as la razón es primordial. Other similar fragments are in the same chapters, Taiji Li. The difficulty to translate these fragments is clear in these examples. The translation of Taiji uh, Li into Spanish by Dominguez is la razón del infinito, while in English, Villarroel translated as the nature of the infinite. Why did Villarroel change reason for nature? And why is infinite written with capital letter in English and not in Spanish? It seems obvious that in these examples, Villarroel was not very cautious in the translation of these important philosophical terms. Well, we, we now arrive to one of my favorite examples. In the third chapter, even more confused, we read, Taiji or Uchi Cheli. Again, the translation into Spanish, El pensamiento del infinito y la razón del infinito, is quite different from the translation into English, The idea of the infinite and the nature of the infinite. It is clear that pensamiento, thought, is not the same as idea, and razón, reason, is not the same as nature. But in fact, the philosophical Chinese term, Li, cannot be translated as any of these words, thought, idea, reason, or nature. To understand the terrible misunderstanding of these phrases, we have to know that the term Li has a very deep meaning in Neo-Confucian philosophy. The two fundamental concepts for Neo-Confucian philosophers are Li and Qi. Everything in the universe, both animate and inanimate, has Qi, a concept that emphasizes the movement, the change, From a certain point of view, qi is the stuff, that means a material substance, but it goes far beyond. We must con consider the dynamic character of the Chinese worldview. Therefore, qi is not only matter, but also energy, process, transformation. To carry out this process, it is necessary a guiding principle to order how to perform this transformation. The li is this principle. This is not a time principle, but an ontological principle. This principle, Li, is very important, even more than Qi, for many Chinese philosophers. This is why the Neo-Confucianism in Chinese is known as Song Min Li Xue, or the school of Li of Song and Min dynasties. Much of the debate that encouraged the development of Neo-Confucian thought during the Song dynasty was the relation between Li and Qi. Let's go back to the Uchi and let's consider the title of the second chapter of the book. Lun Chen Yo Yi Wei Uchi Wei Wan Wu Che She Ye Chan Che R. The most literal translation would be second chapter, talking about the real existence of Uchi, limitless, that is the beginning of the 10,000 things, all that exists. This sentence would not sound strange at all to a Chinese intellectual. In fact, it should summarize Zhou Duin's philosophy. In his modern edition, Villarroel translates, translates uh, this title as on the existence of an infinite being, principle of all things. This, translations, uh, this translation agrees better with that what Kobo wanted to transmit to the Chinese, the existence of an infinite being, who, of course, is God, but a Chinese intellectual with no knowledge about Christian religion would understand very well this title and would relate it to the deepest concepts of Neo-Confucianism. 
he would interpret the word uchi in an impersonal way, not at all as an infinite being or God. These and other examples show that Kobo penetrated into the Chinese intellectual context very deeply. I argue that this fact proves that he had an open mind towards ideas and values very different from his own Western culture. And therefore, Matteo Ricci and his fellow Jesuit missionaries were not the only ones to approach the Chinese culture with an open and tolerant attitude. While most of those Chinese classic quotations that appear in the Shelu were po probably written by a Chinese intellectual, it seems clear that Kobo had to revise the whole book before publication. The fact that in the book it is said that the infinite produced the two principles and from them all things appear is so considerate towards the Chinese tradition that it is nearly heretic. Kobo was able to write this book because he arrived in East, China, in East Asia too soon, in a century, the 16th, when the European atmosphere was more tolerant than it would be in the next century. As a pioneer, Cobo's work did not attract the attention of the church, at least at the beginning. The Shelou probably could not have been published 50 or 100 years later, when the Chinese rights controversy was in full swing and the Dominican order defended the orthodoxy in the teaching of Christianity in China. The existence of this work certainly debunks some of the most common topics about the mendicant friars and their methods of evangel evangelization in their missions. However, at the same time, at the same time, Cobo's open-mindedness could be the cause of serious misunderstandings, which lead to the subsequent limited diffusion of his shelu, both in Manila and in mainland China. This brings us to another question. Was it really a popular book any time? And if not, why was it written by Kobo? The Shelu written in classical Chinese was probably understood only by few of the Sanglais or Chinese in the Philippines. So why was it written and published at a time when the Jesuits were trying to introduce themselves in mainland China and after Michele Ruccieri had already published his Tien Chu Shelu. Lucille Chia argues that the Shelu was written to show what the Dominicans were capable of in their task of converting the Chinese. There may not have been very many copies of the Shelu printed if its chief purpose was to show off the Dominicans' achievement rather than to be distributed broadly to potential converts. What happened after the publication of Cobo Shelu? The Dominicans in the Philippines, as they deepened the study of Chinese culture, they would probably conclude that the terms Tai Chi and Wu Chi, as understood in Cobo Shelu, would lead to important misunderstandings about Chinese intellectuals. At the same time, when the vocabulary for the religious terms became standardized, and especially with the controversy of the Chinese rites, Cobo's work would be understood by other Dominicans as dangerous and probably heretic. And it was probably suppressed by themselves, by the Dominicans themselves. Luckily, one extant copy arrived to us, letting us know this great work a cultural, intellectual, and scientific bridge between East and West. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to Dr. Jose Antonio Cervera for this excellent presentation and for keeping in, in the time. At the end, as I said, we will have uh, time for uh, questions and, and comments. Next, we will have uh, Dr. Ana Busquets from Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. Dr. Busquets is doctor in history from the Pompeu Fabra University, 2008. 
She's a lecturer in the Arts and Humanities Department, where she is a lecturer in, in, in the Arts and Humanities Department. In 2003, she designed and introduced the EOC's East Asian Studies Program, which she directed between 2003 and February 2009. Her doctoral thesis entitled Tratados Históricos, Políticos, Éticos y Religiosos de la Monarquía de China, 1676, de Domingo Fernández de Navarrete, El Texto y Sus Fuentes, focuses on contextualization and analysis of the sources and content of this important work by Fernández de Navarrete. Her main lines of research focus on relations between Europe and China in the 16th and 17th centuries, analysis of the texts by Spaniards on China, and comparison of this with texts by Europeans during the same period, and the construction of the Chinese image from the information provided by these texts. Paying special attention to the documentation produced by Dominicans, by Dominicans. over recent years, she has focused uh, her research on the fall of the Qing dynasty based on European documents and the close links between the Spanish in Manila and the religious orders working in China, in particular between the Dominicans and Victorio Riccio and the Sheng family. Finally, another line of research looks at the questions of gender in the Chinese world and its evolution throughout, throughout history. This morning, she will read her paper, The Meaning of the Tratados of Navarrete and His Influence in the European Vision of China. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yo también quiero agradecer en español la invitación del doctor José Antonio Cervera a participar en este seminario. También al profesor David Lorenzen. También al profesor David Lorenzen, al que he tenido ocasión de conocer aquí. Muy agradecida. Y bueno, voy a cambiar a la lengua inglesa, por mucho que nos pese. Comentábamos con Elisabetta que trabajamos en misioneros en España, sobre todo los misioneros y los primeros que fueron hacia allí, aparte de los uh, primeros que llegaron que eran portugueses eh, cautivos, pues fueron españoles, pero en cualquier caso, bueno, cambiamos al inglés para todos los colegas y me disculparán también por el acento en inglés, que intentaré que sea lo mejor posible. Pero bueno, vamos, vamos allá. Eh, yo también me dedico a un dominico, es decir, a no jesuitas. Well, <laughs> yes. Last year, in the first day of my courses in the university, it surprised me that some of the students came to me asking questions that they were perfectly explained in the syllabus that they have. So to say, people were making a very small use of their sources. This is exactly the same problem that I want to present in this paper. Domingo Fernández de Navarrete was an important Spanish missionary in China on the 17th century, but he's not very well known because he's remembered only occasionally for his activities as a leading opponent of the Jesuit methods, methods of, of evangelization in China. But Navarrete is much more la, than this. In 1676, Navarrete published his Tratados Históricos, Políticos, Éticos y Religiosos de la Monarquía de China, an important book in the construction of the Spanish vision of China in the 17th century, century sorry. and for this reason, the book could be included among the great books on China, which were also published in Europe, like those of Álvaro Semedo and Martino Martini, Jesuit, both of them Jesuit one. However, the repercussions of the tratados uh, regarding the perception of China were far less reaching than those of the books writing by the Jesuits. On the one hand, it was a book of a Dominican, that is to say, it escaped the corpus of the new generated by the Jesuits, which were at that time the cultural reference point of everything to do with China in Europe. On the other hand, the problems that Navarrete had with the Inquisition and the disagreements with some Jesuits directly influenced the fact that it was not as wide-reaching in Europe. In fact, the book was denounced to the Inquisition and Navarrete accused. The Jesuit reaction was immediately. They demand its suppression and their defense was taken by Father Juan Cortés Osorio, who published two anonymous works attacking the Tratados, the Memorial Apologetico and Reparos. Father Cortés had never been to the East, but it was not considered as a handicap. For Cortés, the Jesuits of Europe know more about China than does Friar Navarrete. The main themes of the accusations were an attempt to discredit Navarrete's honesty and common sense. Friar Domingo was accused of snobbery, 
of trying to sell indulgence and medals to costume men and of causing a scandal and corrupting young, young people. We don't know what exactly it does mean, but these were the accusations in front of the, the, Inquis the Inquisition. Exactly what did happen, it, it's not clear, but the Tratados was not condemned, but the projected second edition did not appear, never. In fact, we can find these two problems in contemporary times. Firstly, the work of Navarrete has been never published in a modern annotated edition. The only study that exists is an splendid but a partial translation uh, that uh, the Professor Cummings made in the 1964. A part of this, that you can see the front piece in, in, in the slide, the book, the book has never been object of a serious study by a Spanish historiography. Secondly, the historiography is based on the Jesuit readings of the Tratados, and these have only been used to illustrate it, the theological questions under debate at this time. But as I said before, the importance of the Tratados comes from the knowledge of China that can be gained from them. Through the treatises, especially from one to the four, the information is abundant, and thus this work can be seen to follow on the from the Greek Jesuit writings. The objective of my presentation is to present the tratados, the sources used by Dominican in his book, the description of China that Navarrete makes, and finally to remark some aspects about the importance of the book in the context of the Spanish and the European sources about China in the 17th century. First of all, let me first present you the author for those who could not be familiar with him. Domingo Fernández de Navarrete was born in Spain, Castrogueriz, in 1618 and died in the island of Santo Domingo in 6086, sorry, at the age of 72. He left Spain in 1646 and after having served as a missionary in the Philippines during the first year, the 10 years, he went to China in 1658. Well, well, I'm sorry, this is uh, where the Dominicans had uh, his implementation in, in the Philippine island. And then I have uh, put in this map the two uh, cities or the two places that uh, Navarrete was. First, uh, he worked in Fuan, in the Chinese province of Fujian, and then after two initial, uh, two initial years in Fuan, he went to Jinghua, in the Chinese province of Zhejiang. There, he spent his time in the conversion of the Chinese and also writing some books. From the very beginning, Navarrete seems to have fallen in love with China, and its people, among whom he now remained and working until the outbreak of the persecution of 1664 due to the so-called calendar case. Yang Guanxian, a famous astronomer, presented to the Chinese emperor a formal memorial against the Jesuits, especially against Adam Schall. Uh, when the persecution began, Navarrete was in Xinhua, and his first reaction was to stop the printing of his Chinese catechism. It's a uh, uh, bad uh, luck for us because uh, in the Spanish archive there are any document in Chinese characters from Navarrete. He said uh, in his uh, documents that he had writing uh, a lot of documents in Chinese, but uh, no one, no, none of them uh, has uh, arrived until, until us. His second reaction was to stay in China. He had the opportunity to escape and could easily have made for the Philippines. But that seemed morally indefensible, since the local authorities who had treated him kindly would be punished. He presented himself before the local magistrate, announcing formally that he was a Catholic friar, but the only reply was that he should return home and wait new instructions. Some days later, was sent to Lanchi to join to the two Dominicans there, the Sicilian Friar Domingo Sarpreti and Friar Felipe Leonardo. Then, the three friars went to the prison in Hanzhou. Navarrete described his prison as a well-governed, noviciated house at which we were much amazed, and not even a stay of 40 days there diminished his admiration for Chinese people. Their prison, a well-run republic, in words of Navarrete, was exemplary like everything else in Navarrete's China. Clean, with a well-appointed, much-frequented temple, it had shops, a laundry, and special marrier quarters. The most striking feature of all, however, was the behavior of the prisoners themselves. 
although the men's and women's prisons adjoined and had communicating door, it was noticed with surprise and edification that the men keep to themselves and there was no impropriety. And this is, it was an important point for a Dominican religious in China. Uh, in fact, uh, no, I'm sorry, in fact, Navarrete wrote, we note with attention the courtesy, gravity, and civility with which they dealt one with another and even with us also, even with the foreign people. This will seem incredible to our people at home. Suppose two Chinese went to one of our Spanish prisons. Imagine what tricks could be played upon them by the other golfers. What garnish they would be made to pay. Well, there is none of that there, but, the, but always the same courtesy in everything as if we were great gentry. In this matter, as much in else, that nation, without any doubt, excels all the others in the world. The only criticism uh, about Hanzhou prison was the overcrowding. Well, the situation was tense, and finally, the missionaries at, 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 at that moment were in China, were banished to Macau, and then to Canton, when they arrived on March 1666. Navarrete stayed in Canton during three years until 1669, and at that time he spent there uh, with a community of 19 Jesuit fathers. From the positive point of view, the detention gave him leisure to continue his Chinese studies, and probably he had the opportunity to read well over of 50 Jesuit works in Chinese. He also was able to prepare the material which later formed his two famous books, The Tratados and the Controversias. During this time, he also took part on the uh, so-called Canton Conference from December 1667 until February 1668. The Canton Conference was a formal conference among the missionaries in order to discuss some aspects about their work in China. There were 19 Jesuits against four, four friars. During a month long, the missionaries had debated 40 questions with different degrees of acronymy, acronymy sorry, and a few moments of harmony. Finally, the conference ended with the only peaceful proposal that St. Joseph be named patron of the mission. In 1669, Navarrete decided to leave in order to report to his superiors in Manila or Roma the missionaries practice in China. In Macau, once again, left Rome as a prefect of the Dominican's mission to discuss the questions of Chinese rights. On his return to Spain in 1677, the Pope, at the suggestion of the Spanish king, forced him to accept the Archdiocese of Santo Domingo, where he worked uh, until his death. When Navarrete arrived to Europe, uh, he prepared a trilogy on missions problems. The, he began by writing the controversias, which was his account about the dispute over the Chinese rights, but he realized that this book would be not understood without knowledge of the background. So he started to write his tratados that were written in Madrid in the first half of 1650, 1675 and printed in uh, 1676. The tratados consist of uh, 500 518 pages divided into seven treatises. The first two treat do have here the, the exactly titles uh, from, from Navarrete. The translation are uh, borrowed from Cummings, from the Cummings edition. Uh, the first two treatises concentrate on general aspects of the kingdom of China and on in his political organization. In the third uh, treatise, the dynamic change a little signs in it, Navarrete incorporates some sentences by Confucius, translated into Spanish to which he adds his own comments. The fourth treatise is a translation of the Chinese book Beng Si Po Kam. I will, uh, uh, I will go uh, with this theme uh, after. Uh, at the same time as he accompanies the translation with his own regards, remarks. The fifth, the fifth treatise is a reproduction of a piece by Jesuit Longobardo to which the Dominican also had his own observation. It was a text, a text wrote by Longobardo against richista methods, and Navarrete discovered it during the Canton period. The sixth treatise is the boat to the journey around the wall uh, that author himself made through his life. 
These chapters also include an account of the Manchu invasion, an account of Koxinga, some notes on Letona's description of the Philippines, a critical review of Collins' history of the Jesuits in the Philippines, and also a critical review of Martini's de Velo Tartarico. Finally, the last uh, treatise is, uh, includes some papal proposition dictated in Roma. One of the constant preoccupations of Navarrete was to provide material for future missionaries and to help them to realize the special difficulties of the China mission. In fact, Navarrete saw himself in the role of a military engineer in the church army. Another aspect that is important to consider is the fact that the history of China could become a sermon for Europe. For Navarrete, history was the mirror for every man and the historian, by presenting his reader with the examples and warnings, incited them to the godness. Another preoccupation of Navarrete was the disorder growing in Spain. The changes in the past 30 years were a dramatic shock to Friar Domingo. The change from what seemed a paradise of paternal government that he has seen in China uh, to a state of royal anarchy in Spain was a great shock for his, for his patriotic mind. For Navarrete, China was a model and in his tratados he used many sources in order to reinforce his arguments. Four are the main sources that Navarrete used and sit uh, in the tratados. The first one is his own experience on China. Navarrete was absolutely fascinated by the Chinese civilization and reproduced those aspects in, this, in his pages that, in his opinions, were worthy of being related. He reminded us, uh, again and again, that he was witness to that narrated. Navarrete also includes the oral evidence of Western missionaries, as Brancati, Jean Balato, Antonio Gobea, and Chinese with whom he shared tasks of, of evangelization in China, as well as a Chinese convert to the Christianity or the Chinese to whom he administered in the Philippines. The second source was uh, the main uh, European works on the Kingdom of China that had been written by this time. In some cases, the Dominican dedicates the whole chapter of the Tratados to analyzing some of these works, as is in the case with Martino Martini and his De Velo Tartarico, or Father Francisco Colling with his uh, Labor Evangelica. In other cases, like uh, uh, with Mendoza, Trigol, or Kircher, Kircher, sorry, the allusions are short and always have been accompanied by comments from Navarrete himself. The work by Jesuit Nicolo Longobardo deserves a different treatment. In the five treatises, he reproduced in full the Jesuits' work, adding a few personal considerations about the, comment, the content. Obviously, Navarrete had not the same opinion about all the books that he included in the Tratados, and his differences are especially relevant with two books, the, Historia of Gonzalez, the, Spanish, the Spanish Historia of González de Mendoza and the Italian book uh, um, and the China Illustrata of Athanasius Kircher. The main objections arising with regard to these two authors were their lack of first-hand knowledge of the reality that they describe, neither Mendoza nor Kircher had ever been in the Kingdom of China, and their lack of knowledge of the Chinese language. The third uh, sources used by uh, Navarrete are the Chinese materials. Here, Navarrete used uh, some, or he includes some sentences of the classics, especially from the four books and the five classics. The most reproduced is the Analex of, uh, by Confucius, and Navarrete incorporates the translation of a large part of the book and adds personal comments relating the Chinese uh, writing with the predication of, Chi of Christian doctrine. Uh, the other book is the Ming Xin Bao Jian, or uh, Navarrete translates as uh, Espejo Precioso del Alma, de, del Alma. Navarrete declares that this book was the first book he read in, chi in Chinese. This is exactly the book that uh, Jose Antonio Cervera had talked about, uh, about Juan Cobo. But Navarrete not include any mention to Juan Cobo. It, it's possible that really Navarrete didn't know the translation and he made his translation from an original text in Chinese help it with the uh, Chinese people who were uh, in, the, in the missions with, with him. Uh, another uh, Chinese materials, uh, as you see here, books with stamps, some memorials, books with Chinese stories, uh, one Chinese maps, 
and also uh, he uh, includes the reference uh, one book that it, it could be a dictionary, but because he didn't say is a dictionary, and uh, if we we if we can say that maybe this dictionary was the Tihuay edited uh, at the uh, the late Ming Dynasty. The the other sources, uh, the far the four sources uh, that Navarrete sits uh, in his tratados were some documents that Navarrete have opportunity to consult in Europe uh, when he come back. Another uh, source that Navarrete used in his tratados, but um, he never uh, recognized that he's using is the book uh, that you ha have here, the, the title, Hechos de la Orden de Predicadores en el Imperio de China, that was uh, a manuscript that was written by another Dominican, Victorio Richo, and Navarrete has been in charge with editing this manuscript, but Navarrete decided to uh, write or to wrote uh, his own book, and this manuscript was, uh, I don't know how to say, uh, this was, uh, it, it, it remains unpublished until today. And it is an important source for Navarrete, uh, specifically in three themes. Uh, in some general aspects about China, all the notices about the Chen regime and the Koxinga, uh, the Chen Chengung that uh, in European sources was known as Koxinga, and about all the notices about the uh, entry of the Manchus in, in China. Well, now I'm briefly uh, to present the China of the Tratados and finally some, some remarks. Navarrete's China uh, is a continuation of the positive view formed from early books. In fact, the main stereotypes about China that had been established in the writings of the 16th and 17th centuries appear again in the Tratados. Nevertheless, the Tratados offer a new focus in some aspects, especially those relating to Chinese moral and Chinese Confucianism, and uh, a much more detailed and well-supported approach. In his description of China, Navarrete followed the main aspects that we can find in the previous literature on China. The name of the empire, its location, size, and wealth are presented on the basis of that which was already known, but the Dominican managed to offer much more wide-ranging information. Navarrete is impressed by the size of the country and the magnificence of the land. But Navarrete laudatory account conditions in China must, of course, be put into perspective by regarding it against the contemporary background. Agriculture in late 17th century Spain was in deplorable state. Foreign wars rising within the peninsula and increasing immigration had helped to drain away men and money. With regard to the administrative organization of the kingdom, Navarrete refers the division into provinces and the cities and the towns of each. Navarrete is aware of the examination system by which men enter the public service and describes with an enthusiastic terms. The kingdom's political systems also receives the Dominican's approval and follows the same laudatory tone of the previous books. The most remarkable aspect was the paternal, the paternal monarchy which ruled in China. Navarrete explains that among the Chinese, it was a maxim that the people must obey the emperor with the filial obedience, and that he, in turn, had to love his subjects like a father and always study to find ways of showing his care for them. Like most other relevant writers of these times, Navar Navarrete was very favor favorably, favorably impressed by the Chinese family system. The women are not only attractive, but also virtuous, sacred, and honest, meaning that one does not often see them in public. With regard to the religion of the Chinese, Navarrete, as with the literature that went before him, started that there were three great sects. Uh, the literati, Tao, and Foe, which can clearly be identified with uh, Confucianist, Taoists, and Buddhists. In fact, Navarrete provides much more information about Confucius than could have been learned until there. Finally, I would mention a part uh, the reference about the Chinese language and writing. As I said before, Navarrete had studied Chinese during his time in the Philippines and then in, in China. 
Regarding the Chinese language, Navarrete note that different dialects had, had different pronunciation of the same, same character, sorry, and also that Chinese is a tonal language where a change in a tone totally change character meaning. Regarding the writing, the most interesting thing is the fact that Navarrete includes in his tratados a brief description of at least than more, more than 50 Chinese characters with their etymologies. He explains the Chinese characters, but we didn't draw them. Here I have selected four examples. I don't know if we can read, uh, this is the Spanish uh, book. Navarrete, for example, notes that for money, uh, uh, meaning is given by the letter for methyl on the side and duplication of the letter for arms, one below and one above. So if we check in a, diction, in a Chinese dictionary, we found the modern, uh, the modern character uh, Qian for money. The same uh, in the second example, uh, that white is described by the letter for the sun with a point above meaning clarity that we can identify with pi. Uh, that prison is written with the letter for men placed between four walls and we can identify or we can search the, the modern character, Chinese character. And finally, the male is written with the letter for seed and below that, the letter for strength. That is to say, man was born to work and to earn his daily breath with sweat and toil. The arrangement of the characters used by Navarrete in the presentation of his brief catalog of definitions largely coincides with the Kanshi dictionary classification according to radicals and strokes, although Navarrete sometimes make, make, makes arbitrary and personal choices. Well, to conclude with, uh, with I want to remark uh, seven or eight points. First, attending the information about China contained in the tratados, it's necessary to review the Spanish studies about China who had been focused on Jesuit writings without contemplating the writings of the other orders. Secondly, the Tratados is the most important publication about China in the Spain of the 17th century. Since the Historia de Mendoza, published in 1585, the Tratados is the first book, the first great book, devoted completely to the China, uh, to be published in Spain. Thirdly, the main information that Navarrete assembles in his book on China completely corresponds to the basic stereotype which has its roots in the first Portuguese informants. The point is that a Chinese stereotype seems to have been established in a very short period of time, and it is the same in the Spanish texts of the 16th and 17th century. It is, a big, yeah, it is a big contrast with what happened with the so-called historians, the in, historiadores de Indias, that is, the ones who wrote about America in 16th century Spain. The historiadores de Indias changed European historiography, paying an unprecedented attention to what we would, we would now call anthropolo anthropological issues. Of course, the situation was very different for the Spaniards in America. There were reports coming from every corner and the Spanish administration controlled the whole continent. The image changed quickly from one decade to another and its richness and variety gave a decisive stimulus to the European historical vision. In China, the volume of sources available for the Spaniards was much, was much, le much lesser, sorry, and infinitely less direct. But which are more Chinese than Spaniards in the Philippines, and with the Mexican silver flowing through the Pacific in exchange for Chinese silks, they had an urgent need to have some kind of vision of China to cope with the situation. Someone has to put, in Spanish we said, to put black on white, a general vision of, of, of China. That was the mission of the Spanish book on the, of the 16th and 17th centuries. Thank you very much.